Thought Leadership from PwC. Welcome to PwC's Accounting Podcast. I'm Heather Horn. Today, we're excited to continue our year-end toolkit series, which you may know is an annual series of episodes designed to help you through your year-end close. And even if your company is not currently in year-end, don't change the channel. This information is relevant no matter when your year-end occurs, and some of this advice may help you get ahead in your process. And I think when, when, when I talk to management teams about how to think about communicating with audit committees, the director said that they want management to spend more time on succession planning, on crisis management. Um, they want them to utilize more executive summaries and reduce the volume of materials that come in advance. Um, to be more strategic and forward-looking as they take the audit committee or the board through the issues. And finally, to, to get those materials out, out earlier. I, I should say that, that technology transformation and talent risk were also things that they really wanted um, to hear more about as well. Joining the podcast today is Stephen Parker, a partner in PwC's Governance Insights Center, And joining us again as the special guest host is Kyle Moffat, leader of the professional practice group within PwC's national office. With more than 30 years of experience at PwC, Stevens worked with many boards of directors and shared his perspectives on leading practices for interactions with audit committees, especially at year end. Having seen Stephen in action myself, I promise you he has a lot of great reminders and you'll want to stay tuned for the full episode. So with that, let's listen to Kyle and Stephen. Stephen. Welcome to our year-end podcast series. This time of year, a lot of finance teams with 1231 year-ends are obviously getting ready to to report to their audit committees. I know there's no shortage of new issues to cover, obviously very busy uh, year in in the regulatory space. Um, Before we dive into uh, the specifics uh, on these various focus areas, what are some of the challenges that, that you are seeing today in the engagement between management and the audit committee? Kyle, first, thanks for having me, but but I know that uh, you weren't the one who invited me, so I must admit that it's a little bit of a disappointment to not be able to talk to I'm Heather. I'm no Heather Horn. <laughs> but she will be back, and I know I'll get to visit with her again. But but in, in all seriousness, you know, you're exactly right. There are a lot of challenges um, facing both management teams and directors alike, and uh, and you know what we see is that that audit committee agendas just continue to fill up with uh, you know complex issues, very broad issues, um, so much to cover, and just not uh, the answer is not necessarily just adding more time to the meetings. And, and I think as we talk to directors, as we hear from them, and and we talk to management teams alike, what we find out is that you know there's an opportunity here for management to continue to assist these directors and audit committee members in understanding how the company is specifically impacted by some of these, these items. And, and I'll just mention a couple things that, that may seem very obvious, but that, that, uh, that I think where management teams need to focus. Um, of course, the current geopolitical and macroeconomic environments. And, and there's a lot, you know, a lot you can read on that. Um, but, but my, you know, my point here is, is that management needs to, very specifically describe how these issues are impacting the company, who they do business with, how they do business, financial risks, all those kinds of things, because directors are not living the company day to day, just like management is. Secondly, um, you talked about regulatory standards. So there's a lot of new regulatory standards and and related disclosures. Um, Of course, we're talking about the FASB, the SEC, and, and of course, the varied sustainability matters that companies are going to be wrestling with. Next is really what we see in terms of the evolution of management's ERM processes. So, which I think is appropriate. Risks are more complex. They're more multidisciplinary. And so it only makes sense that management's process would evolve. Um, But the audit committees generally got oversight of those issues and uh, and that process. And, And so I think management bringing them up to speed there and helping the board think about risk oversight. Again, you know, what are the right risks for the board to oversee and how does that get allocated to uh, to the audit committee? 
And two last things, just just the new technologies mm -hmm. that we see, that I'll even say evolving technologies. They're not all new. Some of them are just changing at rapid paces. And, and the risks and opportunities that are created from these transformation eff efforts. And then finally, I think, to, to help audit committees, it's really focusing on that talent strain that companies are seeing. I, I might just add that, you know, we recently completed our 2023 mm -hmm. director survey, corporate director survey. And, and um they, they gave us a couple of really important bits of information. I think when, when, when I talk to management teams about how to think about communicating with audit committees, the director said that they want management to spend more time on succession planning, on crisis management. Um, they want them to utilize more executive summaries and reduce the volume of materials that come in advance um, to be more strategic and forward looking as they take the audit committee or the board through the issues and finally, to, to get those materials out out earlier, I, I should say that the technology transformation and talent risk were also things that they really wanted um, to hear more about as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. You 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 mentioned oversight and continued through a kind of that first portion, just highlighting like oversight, oversight of the board. And I think the interesting piece there is that we have seen from this SEC, from this administration, their focus and emphasis in rulemaking, right, on the importance of board oversight. And I think they're, I mean, don't you think that they're certainly feeling that pressure? I mean, obviously, with, we'll talk a little bit about cyber, but like all of these new requirements, you know, I think that it's just a different focus. And I think that that is that's tending to drive in a different direction than maybe where it's been in the past. And I think this administration, Chair Gary Gensler, you know, the other commissioners, the leaders of these various divisions and offices of the SEC are heavily focused on that, the importance of the board of directors and the audit committee's role uh, in, in an organization. Are, are you seeing that as well? And are they feeling that pressure? I think they are feeling that pressure. And I think that's why, you know, they, they're willing to talk to folks like us more and more to understand how uh, what we're learning from others. Um, you know, the cyber rule, when it came out, it just basically hammered that nail in the yeah. coffin around disclosure of oversight, not mm -hmm. just management's right. oversight yeah. of that risk, but also the board's. And of course, the stakeholder voice that came before the regulator rule was also driving change there. And, and I think they recognize that whether it's human capital, whether it's sustainability, whatever's next is, is going to involve um, some tr greater transparency around what does oversight look like. And so there's just greater focus, you know, from everybody's point. Yeah. So, so with that kind of in mind, so what are the real hot button issues in this current environment that, that you think audit committees are, are looking to hear from their management teams um, about today, well, you know the the trends in the business. You talked a little bit about that. Really, just to make sure that that they they feel they've covered off kind of what's needed from a governance perspective. Yeah, and, and I'm gonna um, I'm gonna talk you know like immediate term and then a little bit longer term. Okay. So so I mean in the very immediate term, I think I think audit committees want to hear specifically about how those how those matters we just described are really impacting year end processes and controls. Some some of them might. Um, they're certainly going to be impacting disclosures in the 10K. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, this is throughout the document. So this is the description of the business. This is in risk factors. Could very well be in MD&A. I think there'll be an expectation that, that there will be some incremental disclosures in MD&A. And then, of course, in the footnotes. Um, and, and they're also going to want to know about how uh, how management teams are thinking about their their forecasts that they have built for 2024 and, and what are the potential downside risks that the company could experience given the complexities? And, and I, I think when you consider what we've experienced in the last three years, and, and I get this from really smart people that I get a chance to talk to, but, but it's, it's not the old normal, if you will. I mean, I think we're moving towards a new normal. The, the trends that economists would normally forecast – based on certain events as they've occurred, don't exist anymore. And so I don't think it's fair that, you know, you think about 2020 forecast and, and it's a kind of a point forecast. It's mm -hmm. one data point. I, I think when you talk to the audit committee uh, or to the full board that you need to be talking about what are the different scenarios. You need to have mm -hmm. multiple scenarios because 
if if you think it's going to happen, it's likely going to happen some you know a different way. You so, sound like the the economist on the at the AICPA conference uh, last week that I attended in D.C. where. That, that essentially was the message of like, well, it could go this way, it could go this way, it could go that way. And it's like, OK, we just don't have any clue which direction things are headed. And it is. It, it obviously highlights the challenges that, that, that companies and, and, of course, management boards are, are facing. Yeah. And, and if we've learned anything over the last couple of years around that crises are real and they're unexpected, then we should be better prepared for them. And so I think – Coming into, you know, Q1, talking about 2023, but also there's a lot of discussion around 2024. Management teams would be well served to talk to their audit committees about those kinds of issues. And and then I think I'll, I'll characterize these things as a little bit longer term. Um, and, and I'll just share with you, you know, in the Governance Insights Center at the end of every year, we think about what – what are likely some of the top governance trends for the next year? And so we've been working on this and just about finalized it, but we've come up with five things. And and just to quickly highlight them, um, the first one is is a repeat. And of course, we've already talked about this before, but I think it's still really important, which is is navigating that macroeconomic and geopolitical environment. And again, it comes back to management because they equip the audit committee and the board to uh, with, with the understanding to to really oversee how these factors will be impacting strategy and the company's results and and can share perspectives around how they might position forecasts um, that they're making you know in terms of public public announcements and and you know the the so, so there's a financial volatility element to that but th- then there's also impacting that and coming from that is just the whole regulatory and compliance landscape very complex, very active, very far reaching. And what does that really mean, you know, for the company? Yeah. And I, and I can chime in on this. I think, look, the, the pace of rulemaking, especially in the ESG space, sustainability space, um, is obviously an area of focus, um, not, not just from uh, companies, from preparers, but, but also from even from us. I mean, we spend a lot of time on it as well. And it certainly is hard to keep up with. Um, you mentioned the, our, our 2023 annual corporate director survey um, brings kind of an interesting perspective to this uh, topic. And the survey results show that 54 percent of directors believe ESG issues are linked to strategy. Um, how are audit committees thinking about ESG and its impact on business activities? Well, I, I think some of them are thinking about it in a more fulsome approach than, than many others. The other thing that our survey told us was while they uh, directors are understanding how how ESG can be overseen and why it's important, they're they're still confused as to how it really drops to value for the company, and so there's a disconnect there. And I think I, I think you know that first part. Why are more of them understanding some of those implications? It's because management teams have been talking about it and. And I think the challenge is that we've been talking about these ESG related items more from a compliance perspective. You know, we're we're going to have to capture this data and we're going to have to prepare for this and and you know, you it's check the box. You, check the you, box, you, right? Yeah. yeah. And and which box are we checking? Are we checking the the box from the, you know, CSRD? Mm-hmm. Are we checking the California box? Are we checking when does the SEC box get checked? All, all that kind of stuff. And I think what's probably missing, and and we talk a lot about this when, when people ask us about um, the, just the, the whole ESG moniker, you know, it's not ESG. It's like which are the important risks that are below those the matters that those acronyms stand for, and and I think that's where the real value is going to come, and that's where the gain is yet to have. I mean, some some audit committees are there and and getting it, and or directors. Um, others still have a ways to go in terms of really translating what those specific risks are under those those pillars E S and G, and um, and how those risks and, and and I should add opportunities really translate into value for the company. Yeah, you know, we we do see a clear movement away from like all of ESG related things are are overseen at the NomGov committee or at the comp committee. I mean, this is a topic that everybody gets to play in the sandbox on. And I think that's mm-hmm. the right answer. Um, so, you know, so folks are getting there, 
But, but I think the gap will be closed as management teams continue to educate directors. And, and I think they've got an appetite for it. I just think they really need time with the management teams to, to translate that compliance item, that risk, yeah. into real value in the bottom. You know, it's, it's interesting, and you mentioned this before, you know, human capital, right? The importance of, you know, your human resources. And I think that's one area where I can tell you that in my conversations with, you know, audit committees or, or even the C-suite, um, that's where I think you know, they, they see more of the tangible benefits, right? Like, you know, setting aside climate reporting and some of the political, you know, kind of views on, on some of that stuff. As far as human capital, like you certainly hear – there's a heavy interest on it, right? And we talked about it. We continue to talk about it, right? From attracting, retaining talent, um, you know, and and it's across the board. It's not just the accounting profession. It's just you know broadly for for companies to ha- have the right people in place to to continue um, the the company operating at a high level. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that you know there there is there is value. It's just very challenging for audit committees for board members to understand the direct financial impacts, right? And so I think that's part of it is is bridging that gap. It's yep. very important for for management to to do that. So great insights on on all of that. And I think um, you know certainly some of some of this information um, really highlights you know that that look if if management's not tracking um, ESG risk now opportunities and impact now really is the time to get focused, right? And to your point. Going down that next level, like let's let's ignore the E, the S, and the G, but let's look at those buckets that that make up those various columns and uh, or various topics. And I think you get kind of you can see the benefits of having more insights as you know as to the importance of of that reporting. Um, so let's let's turn back though to you were talking about some of these hot button issues. Um, audit committees should be focused on what, what else should the uh, audit committees and, and companies be thinking about as they're talking to the audit committee? Sure, sure. We probably got sidetracked on one of the most important ones. Um, you know, a second one is is we we actually see increasing shareholder activism mm-hmm. going on in 2024, and and I don't really think that's an audit committee related item. Although there could be times where the audit committee chair is brought in. Um, or an investor wants to hear from the chair about oversight of audit quality. Um, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised about that, but but dire- directors don't tell me that that happens often. But but just to know, we think shareholder activism and and the ways that they pursue that are going to be a little different and increased. Um, we we also think that there will be um, I'll call it a fortification and alignment in strategy and risk. So I mentioned in my earlier comments about. Um, the, the, the current environment really driving companies to think about risk differently, that ERM process to be different. And, um, and I think directors are beginning to understand that, that strategy and risk have to go hand in hand. In the old days where, where you did a strategy session, you know, maybe in August and you did, you know, oversight of ERM in December from the internal auditor, um, and there was never this link um, and the board didn't deal with, okay, what are the, the real risks? How have they evolved? Do we have them at the right committee with the right competencies? I just, I really think there's a recognition and a movement to that alignment. And I think management teams can help directors mm-hmm. in, in getting there on that. And, and then lastly, I, I think it's really, and this is really at the board level, but our senior executives are going to see a greater focus by directors on, on their culture. The way they operate, the, the way they communicate, and all to drive higher performance, and and that I think is coming from back to that oversight point that you make, mm-hmm. which is now we're we're really accountable for what we're doing, and we're going to have to tell people what we're doing. They're going to be evaluating how well, and it's not that we get it right every time, but do we have the right processes in place to give us the best chance to get it right? And so I, I think directors. You think about we've had some levels of refreshment, you know, could still use more directors tell us that that there's directors on their boards that need to be replaced. Um, so I think we'll continue to see board refreshment. The real question is, as you get those new folks in, are they appropriately teed up, you know, to understand the culture? The culture's designed in a way that they can begin day one and kind of offering their insights. I think that's going to be that kind of that fifth trend that we see in 2024. 
No, that that's incredibly interesting, and I think very insightful, at least for for you know our audience listening to this, just understanding the importance of culture, and it starts at the top, right? And and I think it's tone at the top, and and we hear that, like we hear that from you know standard setters, we hear that from the SEC, we hear that from uh, the the PCAOB, not only at companies, but even you know the accounting firms as well. So, um, really great perspective, Stephen. Um, so, so let me dive a little bit into what we're hearing from directors. And so, again, to back to our survey, um, it does show that 49% of directors see cybersecurity as a significant oversight challenge. Um, and that number has decreased a year over year, um, but also shows that 64% of directors reported an increase in agenda time allocated to cybersecurity, which is no surprise there. Right, right. Um, I can tell you that I've probably spent more time talking to boards about cybersecurity um, and, and clawbacks than probably any topic that I ever thought I, I would do. Um, can you talk a little bit, just unpack that for us? Yeah, yeah, sure. And I, I think this is a really unique area because we spend a lot of time talking about this too. Um, oversight of cybersecurity is one of our most requested topics when we're speaking with management teams or, or with directors. And, and I think, you know, the statistics, you have to kind of, um, I don't know whether it's dig into them or, or stand back a little bit and pay attention to them. But, but so, you know, our headline there is that fewer directors see cybersecurity as a risk. Well, it went from like 59% to 49% or something. So still half of the directors are saying are it's a risk. Yeah. So I don't know how good we should feel about that. <laughs> but, but I think it is okay that there is a lot of progress being made. Um, I, I can tell you that um, that even in our uh, peer exchange meetings, so we we will often have directors gather and we ask them for topics that they want to talk with each other about. Cybersecurity, oversight of cyber cybersecurity is in the top three every time we do those kind of exchanges. That they want to visit with each other about what they're doing, and and I think you know where directors find themselves today is that that while like I said, some significant improvements have been made. There, there's still a long way to go. And and here's what we hear directors talking about when they give credit to to kind of making strides. And this this makes sense to me, and, and I see this uh, often in my interactions. But but they they get regular reporting from management. So not certainly not one time a year. I, I know there's some companies that that don't have you know, kind of the, the, the most significant cybersecurity risk or as significant as others. Maybe it's twice a year, but but I'm hearing more and more, it, there's some element four times a year, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. And it's not just hearing from the the CEO or the CFO. It's hearing from the chief technology officer. It's hearing from the chief security officer. And I think that's really important that, that the audit committee, because most oftentimes cyber oversight sits at the audit committee, but but if not, then the board is getting to hear from some some place in management below that C-suite. Again, it kind of gets to that. So does the tone at the top really trickle down? Do they really understand this exposure? And how, how well can they communicate it? So in addition to hearing about it more and, and more regular reporting and specific reporting, um, I hear directors talk about focusing on outside training. Their uh, companies would go a long way to encourage and 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 promote Absolutely. directors taking outside yep. training. I haven't heard of any that have done that that say it was a waste of their time. Um, but also, if 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 you're not going to do that, well, then bring the experts into the meeting. You know, let them spend ten or fifteen minutes. I think getting that objective voice from somebody other than management is really important in terms of educating um, audit committee members. Um, having a robust discussion around what are the the, the escalation protocols. If something happens, um, whether, whether that, you know, a lot of times that comes up in, as a result of tabletop exercises, um, but, but it gets back to the crisis management thing. I think if, if we should have learned anything, it's that we should be prepared. And so what, what get alignment between management and the, and the audit committee or the directors and what are those escalation protocols that you would go through um, when an incident happened? And then also talking about how materiality might be evaluated, you know, who's, Who's, Who's making table? that call? Yes, yep. exactly. Yep. And what what are the guidelines, right? You're not going to have a formula that gets applied, but but how are we going to think about it? And giving directors a chance to kind of potentially weigh in on that. And then I'll come back to uh, disclosure. Um, so in this 10K is going to be some disclosure around what what is director, you know, what does governance look like at the board level for cyber? 
And, uh, and those that I've talked to who have seen these draft disclosures were surprised that it was a very iterative process. It continues to be iterative. Mm-hmm. So version one, you know, wasn't quite good enough and they wanted some more uh, explanation and, and even rethinking, do we have the right approach? I mean, this is not an aspirational kind of disclosure. Mm-hmm. This needs to be the facts. A lot of good documentation. But I think get, getting ahead of that with the audit committee um, is is a great way to help them you know, get directors up, up that learning curve. I think, I think that's a great point. Right. And, and I've said this many times when we talk to, you know, to clients and even our webcast where we talk about cyber, um, cyber is probably the best topic that really that, that highlights this is disclose what you're doing. Don't, don't be aspirational. Don't embellish. Don't say you're doing something you're not because we've seen the SEC bring enforcement actions against companies um, you know, for, for not just cyber, but other topics where they've said they're doing something. In fact, that's not what they were doing, or they said they had certain policies and procedures in place, but they weren't complying with those policies and procedures. And I think we'll continue to see uh, the SEC focus on that. One other point that I think that resonates with me, and, and I hear you say it um, over and over again, um, and it's the importance of educating the, the board, not just during that meeting, but providing them with information ahead of time so they can adequately prep, be prepared. Um, you're educating them. They, like to your point about taking courses, that you have your your board members, your audit committees, that you, you find either courses for them to take to upskill on cyber. Um, you, you provide them in advance with your escalation policy so they can ask informed questions. And I think that's something that, that you know, Management and, and these teams can certainly help uh, prepare uh, for these uh, audit committee meetings. Um, one th- one thing, and, and I just want to kind of highlight this: uh, the results of this uh, recent uh, Center for Audit Quality audit committee study um, that that shows an increase in disclosure rates across uh, many many topics, um, but uh, certainly acknowledges uh, that in light of this current environment, there continues to be room for in- improvement. And we've we've also seen that from the SEC in the form of their comment letters to companies on their their disclosures and filings. Um, but I think as we think about it, particularly replies to to audit committees um, as their role kind of continues to evolve. So my my final question for you is. As we look forward to year end and the reporting season, what are some of the top things that come to mind for you in terms of best practices uh, with respect to engagement, how management can engage with audit committees? Well, and if I might, just just to expand on that CAQ transparency barometer, yep. because it's really I mean, they've done this for, I think, the last 10 years. And, and their goal, it, when you think about the audit committee report in the proxy, so we've done a lot of talking around increased disclosure around risk oversight. And that often sits in a little different part of the proxy. But then in the back, you've got this audit committee report. It's probably, historically, it's three or four paragraphs, maybe three. Mm-hmm. It kind of just says we, we you know, we compensate them. We have, we have ultimate um, responsibility for their performance, those kinds of things. Very generic kind of stuff. And I think what what the CAQ has been able to identify, and, and none of this has beca- been because of regulation, but companies have been a little more willing to tell a little bit more of their story in that audit committee report. And 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 why do they feel that pressure? Well, because some of these these uh, stakeholders are asking a little bit more about it. And so I think, you know, this is really an opportunity for companies to be thoughtful in their proxy about how. Um, how they can tell their their story of how the audit committee ensures audit quality. Um, and a couple things that are that are coming out of these questions. So I got a question, um, two of them, in fact, earlier this week around, hey, how do we respond? You know, CFOs just called me. They're getting questions about um, our auditor tenure, and and the audit committee wants to know how to respond. You know, how does or even the CFO how to respond? Well. Well, the CAQ added a question this year really asking about, you know, wh- whether um, many companies will say what the tenure is, but but really how how does the audit committee evaluate tenure? So the mm-hmm. positive and negative factors associated with tenure. And, and it's really just getting out there and using that report as a way to not just say effectively what you did, but but to describe how you thought about it. Um, you know, who you might have visited with, all in the spirit of 
telling the story about how the audit committee is ensuring greater quality. And, and I just think I tell executives that they should go look at their peers. You know, I'm not asking them to do necessarily anything that their peer group's not doing, but, but I think their peer group is going to be moving in this direction. And it really gives credit where credit should be due in terms of how the audit committee is actively thinking about quality. Uh, so I think it's a great tool um, for, for management teams to use as they think about that report. And again, that should be provided early enough that the audit committee chair can take a look and provide some comments and thoughts um, in, in terms of answering your original question around, you know, what what should management teams be thinking about um, to drive quality? I think it comes back to communication and it might even be relationship building. You know, I've had a lot of conversations with with management teams and with directors alike as they get back together that 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 there's so much value to the water cooler talk or the, you know, the, the coffee talk. Um, and, and what it does is it helps build trust between management and the audit committee. And I think that's that's very important. So at a minimum, you know, keeping the audit committee chair aware of what's going on, not just at the call before the meeting, but maybe it's monthly. There's just some checkup, even if it's a, a you know, an email message that says, here are some things we're working on or just a status. Um, I think it comes back to materials. Those materials equip directors to be able to execute on that oversight responsibility. I, I heard uh, Ken Robinson said, quantity doesn't equal quality. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was valuable. He even Absolutely suggested was, yeah. he, he suggested that management should ask directors what can be taken out. You know, I, I hear some say, well, just put it in the appendix. But I loved his idea about, you know, ask the question, what can we really take out? And, um, and I think the chair needs to step up and, you know, because there will be some directors that probably – want to leave it in there, but, but, but we should be very critical of what's in there. You know, th- things like uh, minimizing company acronyms, it, you know, these guys are not in the office every day and they don't, they don't know all that. I'm so, still learning PwC yeah, yeah. acronyms <laughs> since joining in 2020. Yeah. So it, it never ends. Yeah. We're, never we're, ends. We might be the worst at it, <laughs> um, but, but I think it's really important and and exec, executive summaries at the front of each one and framing the issues. You know, what are the big ticket issues? What do you want their perspective on? What do you want them to act on? And then the last thing I might say, and, and again, I think Ken, Ken did a great job of, of laying this out in my last conversation with him, but it is about thinking about the meeting, um, your time in the meeting as really a discussion of the stuff that you've already provided them and not a presentation. It's not a page flip or a, a slide deck flip. It's it's a it's a, a thoughtful, condensed discussion around those things that really matter. And, uh, you know, I, I think if, if all of those things happen and, and I know I've I probably talked about these for the last couple of years, but it's still worth talking about. There's still room for improvement. I don't think they're the silver bullet. Um, there's not a silver bullet, but they will go a long way to help audit committees deal with that first point I made, which is the agendas are full, complex things, um, you know, and, and so implementing one or a combination of all these things, I think goes a long way to helping audit committees be more effective. I think that's, that's very well said. And, and one of the things that I think really stands out to me from kind of this conversation, um, is the importance of everyone being involved, seat at the table. So it's gotta be across the organization. So when you want to upskill or, have conversations with your audit committee chair or their board members, the importance of involving the right people, pulling in the right people, whether it's investor relations, whether it's, you know, your you know, counsel, general counsel, the, the importance of financial reporting. And you talked about proxy, like you look at proxy statements, right? You, you, Stephen, you look at proxy statements and, and, you know, have observations on it and you share them today. You know, I think it's something where historically, the accountants would kind of just turn a blind eye to it and say, it's in the proxy, who cares? Well, you know what? All of these disclosures today are are so much more qualitative in nature. It really highlights the importance of everyone being educated and upskilling everyone else, bringing everyone along for the ride, the importance, and there's value in doing that. Um, Certainly. I, well, I enjoy this. Thank time. you so much, Steve. And I, we, we really appreciate your time and just a lot of fantastic insights. Hey, you're welcome, Kyle. That's our show for today. Tune in next week for more fresh episodes so that you never miss any of our audio content. Follow the PwC Accounting Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. 
And to stay up to date on all our latest accounting and reporting news, sign up for our newsletter at viewpoint.pwc.com. From Thought Leadership at PwC, I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates, and they sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.